It's Saturday, February 6th, and this is For Good Reason. Welcome to For Good Reason. I'm DJ Grothy. For Good Reason is the radio show and the podcast produced in association with the James Randi Educational Foundation, an international nonprofit whose mission is to advance critical thinking about the paranormal, pseudoscience, and the supernatural. Before we get to this week's guest, Daniel Loxton, I'd like to invite our listeners to check out randy.org for details about some recent developments at the JREF. First, you'll see news of a couple job announcements. We're looking to hire a director of educational programs and also an administrative director. In addition, you'll learn some ways that you can easily support the important work of the foundation, like through the Capital One Visa card that we offer. If you're the type to responsibly use credit, we'd love for you to help out the JREF by getting the JREF Visa card. And also, you'll learn about the new membership drive we're launching. If you care about the values that the JREF advances, the values of critical thinking, about the supernatural, about the paranormal, we'd love your support. I'm happy to have Daniel Loxton on For Good Reason. He's editor of Junior Skeptic, the children's section of Skeptic Magazine, a quarterly science education and science advocacy magazine published by the Skeptics Society. The magazine's been called stimulating and provocative by Carl Sagan, clearly superior, gutsy by E.O. Wilson, and the best journal in the field by Stephen Jay Gould. And Daniel joins me on For Good Reason to talk about his new book, Evolution, How We and All Living Things Came to Be. It's a children's book. It's based partly on a two-part junior skeptic story. Daniel, welcome to For Good Reason. Hi, DJ. Thanks for having me on. Well, I uh, wanted to have you on because this book, my gosh, what a great project, a book on evolution, a serious book. It's not dumbed down, but it is explicitly for children. Uh, let's start off. I just want to ask you, why do you think there are so few books out there like this? Well, you know, <laughs> it was a surprise to me how few there are. You know, since the book's just been released uh, in the last couple of weeks, and, uh, you know, I've been a little bit of a giddy schoolgirl about it, uh, you know, checking to see how sales are going on Amazon and running down to my local bookstore to see if it's in yet. Right. Such great reaction uh, in the blogosphere. It's been well-reviewed, and it's climbing the rankings on Amazon, eh? Yeah, it's off to a great start, which is uh, very rewarding after all this uh, all this time toiling away in, in the attic. Um, anyway, I, we, uh, my father and I, we walked into... Uh, Chapters, the local mega bookstore here in Victoria, and uh, went down to see uh, if it was in yet, and it wasn't. But uh, he walked up to the uh, bookstore lady in, in the children's section, which is, you know, the largest section of the largest bookstore in the provincial capital of British Columbia. He said, do you have any, any uh, books about evolution for kids? She said, oh, well, let me check my computer, and, uh, and came up with one. Wow. One book for kids on the central organizing principle of biology. I found that kind of amazing. <laughs> uh, you know, I've done some other interviews about this book uh, since it's been released, and, and I've been saying things along the lines of, um, you know, there are many high-quality uh, evolution books for kids. Ours is distinguished by the following things. Um, but, you know, I, I really have been overestimating, I think, how, how much material is available for kids. I mean, there have been good books published over the decades, you know, in the 150 years since the, since the theory was published, but uh, things that are readily available at your local bookstore, uh, practically nothing. And do you have a guess as to why? Is it just because evolution creationism? Is it that the notion of evolution is so controversial? Or maybe people guess that maybe it's just too complicated, too hard of a scientific issue for youngsters to grasp? I've, I've heard both objections. I'm sure both things are operating. Um, when we were shopping the book around to uh, a large U.S. children's publishers, uh, we heard more than once that it was too controversial uh, or too hot, which was, you know, really astounding to me. But, uh, you know, uh, that's, that's how it went. And, uh, and, of course, that combination of factors of, you know, the, the people involved may not uh, agree with modern biology. 
uh, or they may assume that their market will not agree with, with modern biology. Mm. Uh, those same factors play out for publishers as, as for local bookstores. That's what's amazing about uh, this book being published, because it's not only about evolution. Uh, of course, it's about evolution, but it, one thing that sets this book apart is that it covers for kids some of the objections to evolution that they might hear. So talk about controversial, right? You uh, get into a little of the creationist notions, maybe that human footprints have been found together with dinosaur footprints or some pseudoscience uh, challenges to evolution. Uh, this is something you felt like you needed to challenge head on in the book. It wasn't enough just to talk evolution, right? Yeah, that's correct. And um, I aimed the book for uh, sort of a, uh, I think, something of a, of a novel strategy on that, uh, where on the one hand, uh, you know, notwithstanding it's for kids, I wanted to, in a substantial, direct way, tackle those objections. Because those are the objections that, that people, regular folks, bring to the table when they're encountering evolutionary biology. Uh, and those are the objections that, that kids will have inherited from their parents or their community. But on the other hand, I didn't want to divide, I didn't want to make it an us and them kind of issue. You know, mm-hmm. this, this is the science. The science is a great asset for all of humanity. This book is written for, for 8 to 13 year olds. I think it's the science in, in quite a deep way is accessible to 8 to 13 year olds if it's made, made uh, uh, clear enough. Um, so I, I, didn't, I didn't want to carve up humanity into, uh, uh, you know, uh, different different camps. I wanted to just deal with the arguments on their face. So uh, I'm, I'm not actually sure that the word creationism even shows up in the book, uh, but on the other hand, a number of, of uh, uh, arguments which are common pseudoscientific arguments advanced by creationists are directly dealt with. Right, scientific arguments or pseudoscientific arguments, depending on how... Uh, how <laughs> you might want to characterize them. <laughs> That's right. Another beautiful thing about the book, uh, well, beautiful, it's the artwork, the absolutely beautiful artwork. Thank you. Uh, these gorgeous, big, full-color illustrations. You have cartoons in the book, diagrams, photographs. Also, a number of these computer-generated creatures, right? It's, it's like something out of, you know, right off Discovery Channel or something. These woolly mammoths, other creatures you have in there. It, it's like... From the computer uh, design, it's not you know just by your pen. Uh, so this is a kid's book. I guess you need a lot of pictures in it to get the message across, right? Yeah, that's. Uh, I mean, <laughs> this this is funny. You know, uh, organized skepticism is, is uh, you know it's, it's grown out of a kind of academic roots and and the idea that you know it it matters to have pictures. Some of those kinds of things are things that we're still reaching for. Um, Junior Skeptic is a project which is. The, uh, the section of Skeptic Magazine that I do uh, has always stretched and reached for those kind of uh, production values that would allow it to compete in the marketplace of ideas. This book has, uh, has I think, upped the ante considerably from, from my previous work and I think from, from uh, the general production values that skeptics are used to. You're right. I want to say some of the images are, I mean, they're just breathtaking. Great images. They're, they're frame-worthy. Great job there. Um, Daniel, you do, uh, another beautiful thing in the book, and this is just like, Hey, let's have Daniel on the show so I can congratulate him on this <laughs> great book. But I'm serious about this. You not only get into evolution, uh, so kind of the brute fact of evolution, ex- it explains how every aspect of life got here. Uh, but, um, you kind of tease out the, call it the wonder coming from that. Any adult I know who stops and thinks about evolution explaining everything from the petals of the rose uh, to the lungs of a whale or the wings of a pterodactyl, long extinct, you know, every aspect of life is explained by evolution. That is an amazing reality that kind of stops you in your tracks. Do you think kids are going to similarly be bowled over by how amazing evolution is? It's kind of inspiring to me. I wonder if you think kids are going to get that inspiration. Well, I, I think a, a failure to appreciate that, that uh, the kind of awe and wonder of the natural world there, I think that's one of the barriers for, for trying to create these books for kids. Publishers don't see how that can be, uh, how that can be done. It seems complicated. It seems dry. Uh, but as you say, you know, that, uh, you know, if, if I may use this in sort of a paraphrase way, but the, the, uh, uh, the spiritual uh, power of understanding billions of years of history of life on Earth and the interrelatedness of all living things, uh, you, know, it's, uh, you know, it is a blow-your-socks-off kind of an idea mm. if, if you're able to communicate it. Now, 
I'm I'm by no means the first author to try. Uh, you know, Darwin himself. You know, when he he wrapped up the Origin of Species on a, just an unabashedly romantic note, writing there is grandeur to this view of life. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, I try to I try to set that same note. Um, I think it's a kind of uh, hook that will make people interested in the material, but it's 100% how I feel. You know, it's, so it's not just a gambit to get the ideas across. It's actually one of the ideas you want to get across. It's, it's maybe the primary idea I want to get across, is that, that uh, the, the power of, the, of understanding that the natural universe is comprehensible. Uh, you know, that's, that's the understanding that I want to pass to my young son, it's the, the thrill I see when I see the, those ideas, you know, sparking in his eyes when he tells me that birds are really dinosaurs. You know, mm-hmm. it's, uh, it's, it's powerful stuff. It's, uh, you know, it's kind of an emotional powder keg for a parent. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'd like to let our listeners know that you can get a copy of Evolution, How We and All Living Things Came to Be through our website, forgoodreason.org. Daniel, almost as an aside in your book, you say that evolution doesn't actually do anything. So, you know, we just talked about the inspiration we can derive from evolution, but then you say the the notion of evolution doing something is just a figure of speech for all these mindless processes. So you're talking about drawing inspiration from mindless processes. You actually say something like there being no brain, no intelligence behind evolution that's running things. Um, I really like how you compare evolution to the weather. You say evolution is a process that happens naturally and unthinkingly like the weather. So uh, where are you getting inspiration from something that has no purpose in, in that sense? Well, <laughs> I, I feel almost funny making this argument. As, as you know, uh, as, as a few of your listeners may know, um, I'm something of a skeptical purist. I, I've argued that skepticism should not be linked too closely to, to humanism or atheism or some of these parallel rationalist movements. But mm-hmm. uh, you know, I I am a humanist, and and when I uh, you know when I look around my own life and derive meaning from the relationships I have to my close relatives and my extended relatives and to all of humanity and to the biosphere in general, uh, you know those those relationships are. You know, it, it's really, it escapes me how anyone could face up to that that reality uh, and, and not be moved by it, not be swept away by the, the, by the, uh, the intimacy of those relationships and also the, the incomprehensible vastness of the cosmos. Mm. But you're saying you're not shying away from maybe the atheistic implications or call it the philosophically naturalistic implications of thinking of evolution as mindless as the weather. Well, you know, I, I don't shy away from that personally. Um, you probably noticed that the book strikes uh, what, what might be called an accommodationist uh, tone or position. Right. It deals with religion only very briefly, uh, and it says, you know, it just kind of briskly says, science is the science, which is a position which is acceptable to most mainstream religious believers. Um, and, you know, uh, science, uh, you know, scientists are not the authorities on, on uh, spiritual matters. You know, talk to your friends about those things. Talk to your parents, to your community leaders. Um, at the moment, we're just talking about the brass tacks of science. So, you know, on, on the one hand, uh, you know, I'm, I'm swept away by, by evolution. Uh, but, you know, I, I think that, that many people can have that experience regardless of whether or not they personally are theists of, of one brand or another. Mm. You're right that the book doesn't spend a whole lot of attention on the whole conflict between science versus religion. You basically just say that science cannot speak about religion, and you try to leave it at that. That's the accommodationist line that you're talking about. But on the other hand, uh, you know, when you say, uh, direct quote from the book, science is our most reliable method for sorting out how the natural world works, but it can't tell us what those discoveries mean in a spiritual sense uh, to understand what that is, go talk, you say, go talk to your friends, your family, your community leaders. You don't tell kids to go talk to their religious leaders, right? So you, you stop short of embracing religion somehow in this book. Well, you know, I, it would be disingenuous for me to embrace religion. I personally am not religious, um, but I'm aware that, you know, any random cross-section of people buying this book or any book a large percentage of them will be religious. Now, I'm not catering to them. Uh, I'm not catering to anyone. I'm just trying to lay out the science and make it accessible for kids. Um, but it's, uh, 
this topic has to come up. It's the the most common objection to understanding modern biology by far. Um, and I just, uh, you know, it, it is not my place to tell people about the existence of a god or the existence of an afterlife or, or uh, you know, what people ought to do in their ethical relationships. That's not my job as a good science writer. So I just, I just you know, set that entire matter aside, leave that up to, to parents and families. And, and uh, you know, it's just out of scope for the book and out of scope for science. Right. Well, I don't want to be too disagreeable, but... Uh, wow. <laughs> Well, on the one hand, you try to uh, kind of set it aside, uh, maybe even skirt the issues, some might argue. On the other hand, you're pretty clear, the way I read it, you're pretty clear that uh, not only are you saying science doesn't have a place in those religious discussions, you're saying religion does not have a place in these scientific discussions. I mean, when you compare evolution as a mindless natural process to the weather, j- just look at anthropology. Look at uh, in our distant past, people believed that even the weather was a function of the gods, you know, the god of thunder, god of rain, whatever. We all grew out of that. Nobody really believes in those gods anymore. And if you're saying evolution is like the weather. Uh, some people think you need a God to explain how life got here. Um, but no, evolution is as mindless as the weather. There are kind of atheistic implications in all of that. Um, well, I mean, think, think about it like this, you know, for, for a billion Catholic, it's more or less acceptable to say science is true. God stepped in somewhere and infused souls into hominids. Now mm. I have no ability to examine that question. You know, that, that assertion is, is uh, you know, it cannot be tested. It is, to my mind, uh, as, as, a, as an atheist personally, it's just kind of a metaphysical utterance that has no actual meaning to me. You know, it's just, uh, it, might have, it might as well be poetry. Um, so, I, I'm, you know, I'm hardly going to attempt to refute it. When I talk about the mindlessness of, of evolution, uh, there could be exceptions in there. I mean, who knows if, you know, the uh, the gray aliens have, have periodically stopped in every couple million years <laughs> and fiddled with us. But, I mean, could you could, would you know it if that had happened? But at this point, we have no need of that hypothesis. We don't see that anywhere in, in the findings of science. Um, you know, when I talk about the mindlessness of, of evolution, more what I'm trying to address is a, is a problem in language. That, uh, you know, when when you talk about the history of life, you have to talk about things like design. You have to talk about things like competition. But any of those things have a kind of, you know, they, they imply a sort of agency, which is not, as far as we can tell, uh, present in the natural world. So so you're letting children know, hey, it is a metaphor. Evolution isn't actually doing this. There's no, uh, it, it, it kind of just happens. There's no evolutionary agent, you know, like in the Marvel Universe, the high evolutionary, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, that guy's got a goofy suit, but um, the uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's right. You know, as as far as we can tell, these things just unfold like the sorting of pebbles on a beach. You know, or or as, as I suggest in the book, as like the weather. Uh, but the way we talk about it implies agency, and and so you know, it's just kind of a failing of English language. It's it's really hard to deal with as a writer. And uh, my editor, a, a very accomplished uh, kids' book veteran. Valerie Wyatt, uh, she and I struggled back and forth at every one of these instances where, you know, there's an, an implied, you know, I, either it, it seems to imply that evolution is looking into the future, which it can't, you know, a, a natural selection only operates under the conditions that are, that are operating at this very moment. It can't, can't make predictions. Right. There's no idea of progress in evolution. There's no ultimate end point. Well, you know, that that's a kind of a question. There is definitely no ultimate endpoint. Um, you know, you can, if you pick this index or that index, you can you can uh, uh, find progress in, in the history of life. Things do go in different directions. Uh, but, but it's really arbitrary what things we're identifying as progress. It's just one thing happening after another. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Why is it, you know, is, is it the case that intelligence is a, is a sign of progress? Uh Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe that's you know, purely just an aside, a, a, an inconsequential detour. Yeah, or uh, an accident of evolution that's actually a curse. You know, there's been that uh, of kind of cheeky dismissal of our big brains. Uh, but, you know, these things are in some sense progressive. You know, like there was a time in natural history where those things were not present on the Earth, and over time, cognitive complexity increased to such a point that that you and I can be having this conversation right now. So, you know, there, there are, we can see trends in, in the fossil record, but they're haphazard. 
Right, but not progress in the sense that evolution has a goal for all of us to be arriving at. In other words, that humanity somehow is the pinnacle of the design of evolution, or that... Um, I remember Mark Twain talking about that. He said, uh, you know, in, in his uh, obviously much more pithy phrasing, but he uh, uh, said, imagine the Eiffel Tower. You know, the entire tenure of, of mankind is like the, you know, like the, the width of the depth of the of the paint on the knob on the top of the Eiffel Tower, and the rest <laughs> of geologic time is like the tower. So, uh, you know, it, uh, he says, well, uh, you know, it must must be that the the whole tower is there just for the bit of paint. I don't know. <laughs> Daniel, I love the tone of the book. You've called it accommodationist. Now, I don't want to take that away from you, but uh, it's atheistic enough for me. I think secularists and skeptics of all stripes should pick up this book for their youngsters. Um, you're right that it's not kind of this hardline, angry atheist kids book. I'd like to see that book written. That'd be a funny <laughs> funny book to read. Um, but, uh, I love this book. Anyone who wants a good entree into discussing evolution with their kids and even these, you know, more of these philosophy questions or religious issues can get into that through this book, the science, of course, but also the other stuff. I want to thank you for joining me on for good reason, Daniel. It's a, it's a great book. And a tremendous pleasure. Thank you very much for having me on. And to finish up the show, this week, The Honest Liar Considers Dangerous Deceptions. Here's Jamie Ian Swiss. What's the most dangerous deception of all? A week ago, Jim McCormick, a 53-year-old former police officer, was arrested in England on charges of fraud. McCormick is managing director in the British firm of ATSC Limited, who manufacture the ADE-651 Bomb Detection Unit, or more accurately, a dowsing machine. Officials in Iraq, where the ATSC device was widely used by the Iraqi military, said they would begin an investigation into why their government paid at least $85 million to the British company for at least 800 of the dowsing bomb detectors. Eighty-five million dollars. Now, dowsing is easy to test. Invariably, when James Randi has tested dowsers around the world, he runs a preliminary demonstration in which the dowsers are shown where the target, say a glass of water, is actually located, perhaps concealed beneath an inverted bucket or, hell, science doesn't have to be complicated, let's say under a hat. In the preliminaries, the dowsers seem to always find the object a success rate of about 100%. But then, when the target is secretly located in double-blind testing, dowsers consistently perform with a success rate of about 1 in 2. In other words, as dictated by chance and chance alone. So dowsing doesn't work and never has, but the movement of the bent coat hangers or forked stick or ADE-651 bomb detection unit is often dramatic and seemingly mysterious, thanks to what's known as the idiomotor response. Idiomotor action was a term coined in 1852 by the psychologist and physiologist William Carpenter, who described it as, quote, the influence of suggestion and modifying and directing muscular movement independently of volition. Independently of volition. That's the important part. In other words, the person holding the bent wires or whatever object is supposed to move is actually responsible for moving the object themselves with tiny, almost undetectable muscular activity. And they don't know they're doing it. Idiomotor action explains how, in the era of spiritualism, seance tables tipped, turned, and sometimes crawled around the seance chamber thanks to the unconscious pressures of the fingers and hands of those seated at the table. If you've ever seen a Ouija board mysteriously spelling out words and messages, that's idiomotor action, too. Even today, power utilities in many parts of the country still rely on dowsers to attempt to detect water. Far more disturbingly, idiomotor action lies behind the controversial practice of so-called facilitated communication, in which facilitators claim to translate the intentions of patients seriously damaged by autism, brain damage, or even those who are comatose. But all of these examples, from water dowsers to facilitated communicators to bomb-detecting soldiers, often share a frustrating and disturbing aspect of the idiomotor phenomenon, namely, that most practitioners are sincere. When dowsers show up for scientific testing, they believe they're going to succeed because, by and large, they're not actively engaged in any deliberate fraud. No one is being more fooled than themselves. And so, when the tests fail, dowsers tend to think that the phenomenon is simply unpredictable and a little mysterious, that they're just having a bad day. 
Cognitive dissonance is typically resolved by the practitioners holding on to his belief system. It's easier for humans to believe we've had a bad day than to accept that we're just plain wrong. So dowsers and facilitators believe in their skills and abilities and tools and devices because of subjective validation. They sooner believe the evidence of their own eyes and experience than the critical inquiry of the scientific method. But if I have learned anything from my life as a magician, I know this. Human beings, all human beings, including magicians and scientists and police and judges and military purchasing agents too, are incredibly lousy observers. Without the double-blind test, what we think or guess about the world, based solely on observation, is about as reliable as the daily weather report. Eh, bad example. So it's just possible, perhaps not likely, but it is possible that Mr. McCormick, for all his millions in profit, believes in the legitimacy of his product. I'm not betting the farm on that, and it doesn't alter the fact that no matter what he believes, he should be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law for selling a useless product that cost innocent lives. But in fact, when it came to the scientific evidence against the bomb detector, Major General Jihad al-Jabiri, the head of the Iraqi Interior Ministry's Directorate for Combat Explosives, said, and I quote, Whether it's magic or scientific, what I care about is detecting bombs. I don't care what they say. Now, while we can speculate that the Iraqi general might have been provided with some financial motivation for ignoring the scientific evidence against the device, despite the fact that it was, in essence, killing people, we can't be certain, because it's also possible that the general didn't care because he had personally witnessed the function of the device. I don't care what they say, saith the good general, perhaps because he cared more about his own subjective experience than about what any damn scientific method had to say about it. And people died. And so... What is the most dangerous deception of all? Self-deception. This is Jamie Ian Swiss, and I am The Honest Liar. Thank you for listening to this episode of For Good Reason. To get involved with an online conversation about this episode yourself, join the discussion at forgoodreason.org. Views expressed on For Good Reason aren't necessarily the views of the James Randi Educational Foundation. Questions and comments on today's show can be sent to info at forgoodreason.org. For Good Reason is produced by Thomas Donnelly and recorded from St. Louis, Missouri. For Good Reasons Music is composed for us by Emmy Award-nominated Gary Stockdale. Contributors to today's show included Jamie Ian Swiss and Christina Stevens. I'm your host, DJ Grothy. <laughs>